Good morning. Can we all stand to worship the Lord? All right. Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for today and just uh, for this time of year where we get to celebrate when uh, you became flesh and dwelled among us, Lord, uh, to die on the cross for our sins and, and to provide us eternal life. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven nature sing. Joy. Oh 
us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, praise His holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, I forget not all His benefits. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, praise His holy name. Who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who crowns you with love and His tender mercies, praise His holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and redeem my life from the power of the grave. As far as the east is from the west, he's removed my transgressions away. Who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who crowns you with love and his tender. forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who crowns you with love and his tender mercy, praise his holy name. Now 
This morning, our scripture reading comes from Psalm 2, where we read, Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. Amen. Well, this morning we get a chance to focus in a way that uh, is special on our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we turn our attention to communion, a couple of things that we want to be mindful of is, uh, first and foremost, it only really makes sense within the context of the body of Christ. For those of us who are born again, who are redeemed, who have come to faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ, communion is specifically designed for us as a uh, way to remember what we understand that he's done for us and that we've received through personal faith. So if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, this is not designed for you. Um, it, it doesn't really carry much significance anyway. Um, and so, but there's something that you need to know this morning, and that's that this particular ceremony can be designed for you. Um, it is a celebration of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came to earth, that perfect sacrifice, the sinless Son of God who came, who was sent to this earth. At Christmas time, we celebrate his birth. When he, the star appeared to the shepherds in the field, and years later, when he was a toddler, the Magi came from the east in search of this king who was born. So who is this king? Well, this king would be born as a baby, but he would grow up to become an adult. He would live a sinless life, and he would go to the cross because he was sent for a purpose. He was sent on a mission, and that was to die for you and me in our place and to pay the penalty for our sins. And through his death, and only through his death, we have forgiveness we of sin, we have eternal life, we have a gift offered to each one of us. And if you're here this morning and you say, I've never made that decision before to trust in Jesus Christ for my eternal destiny as my Savior, now's your chance. And if, if that's where you're at this morning, you just have to tell the Lord, I'm ready to receive what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And, uh, and when we go to prayer in a moment, 
you pray that prayer, and then this ceremony is absolutely designed for you. For we who are already believers in Christ, there is a, uh, an, a, something we should be aware of. There's a, a warning in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 about participating in the communion ceremony, remembrance, observance, in an unworthy manner, essentially of having unconfessed sin. Uh, it says in 1 Corinthians 11, he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. So we have this opportunity to examine ourselves. There's this concept that we read about in the book of 1 John called fellowship, of this close walk, uh, this harmonious relationship between us and the Lord. And it is sin, even after we come to faith in Christ, that comes back in and creates a problem with that fellowship. And it's the Lord wanting us to examine ourselves, to humble ourselves before him, and to let his Holy Spirit search us, and then to acknowledge and confess those sins, seeing them as he sees them, as disgusting in his sight for a holy God who can have nothing to do with sin. And then his word tells us that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's who he is. His character is one of forgiving. It's gracious. So in a moment, um, we're going to uh, observe these elements. Um, so as we begin right now, let's just take a moment of silent prayer. And each of us, wherever you're at with the Lord, you can come to him with um, anything that by way of sin or if it's a matter of salvation to begin with, um, this is your opportunity to, to talk to the Lord about whatever it is. cost when we reflect on the death and the sacrifice of our Savior. We pray this morning that we would uh, set aside the things that um, are distracting to us and that we would be able to um, reflect on what's before us. And at this Christmas time, this season where we celebrate the birth of your son, this ceremony reminds us of what he accomplished during his time on this earth and specifically what he did for each one of us. His love for each one of us is tremendous. And we read about that in your word, and we're thankful for that. We ask that you would bless this time that we have, that you would make it um, resonate with each one of us as we participate in, in eating, these, eating and drinking these elements together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to um, begin with a scripture reading at this time, and uh, hopefully you've got your, your communion cup there ready, um, but this scripture comes from John chapter 6. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is to, for the bread of God is He which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. Then said they unto Him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that ye have also seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that has sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that, every, that all, of all, which, of all which he has given me I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that has sent me, that everyone 
which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So you can go ahead and peel back that first layer there. And as we hold the, the bread together in our hands, I, I'm struck by the, the references that our Lord Jesus made to himself as the bread of life and tying it back to the manna which God provided miraculously in the wilderness as the children of Israel were, were wandering. They didn't know where their food was going to come from, and yet God provided day after day and sustained them. Then the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we turn our attention now to the cup, uh, we've got another scripture. It comes from John chapter 15. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. And he that abides in me, and I in him the same, brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows knows not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. No longer servants, but friends. And, you know, when we consider the cup, and uh, you probably got it in your hand there, um, you know, there's a lot of components that come to mind. It's, it reminds us of the blood which our Lord shed on his way to the cross. It reminds us of the new covenant that we read about in the book of Hebrews. And it also reminds us of what it literally is before us, and that is the fruit of the vine. And that passage I love in John 15 that reminds us about the importance of abiding in him. So you can go ahead and peel that top layer there and hold on to that together for a second. Everybody got it? Okay. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this, covenant is the, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Do this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. In your Bible, please open up to the book of Revelation, chapter 11. We're going to continue in our study in the book of Revelation today. And uh, as we begin, let's take a moment for a word of prayer and uh, we'll get into our study. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning in uh, a time that is unique 
and has unique challenges. And sometimes it is a time that feels overwhelming and we feel like evil is going to prevail. But thank you for this passage which tells us so much about who you are, who we are, what you're doing, what history holds, how it's going to unfold. Lord, this morning we lift up those in our congregation that are facing various trials, health-wise, um, maybe some of the different hardships that they've been facing because of the, the lockdown and the shutdowns and um, the things that have ensued over the recent months. We ask that you would uphold and sustain them and help each one. We lift up again our leaders. We continue to pray for them and ask that you would give them wisdom that you would help them to navigate the difficult decisions before them. Um, Lord, we also ask for those that don't know you for their salvation, that you would get them people in front of them that would be able to proclaim to them the clear message of salvation and their need for a Savior. We ask again, Lord, also for our leaders in our state, in our local leaders, in our national leaders, that you would remind them of who you are, Make it so abundantly clear and obvious that you are at work, that they are not supreme, but you are, and that they need to make decisions in light of you and your will and your ways and your principles. We ask that you would do your mighty work in our day, that this end of 2020, as we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate the birth of your son, that it would be a, an amazing time and that you would work through the events of this season to proclaim the gospel boldly. That people might, maybe their lives have quieted down and slowed down to the point where they can actually hear the gospel message for the first time and actually reflect and think about it. We pray that you would be stirring up hearts that in your ways in which you're working in your judgment, that you would be causing a great revival to come about. We ask that you would start that with us, Lord, and that we would be responsive, that we would be available to what you're doing. We ask for our church that we would put you first and foremost, that this would be a place where you are honored and glorified. And Lord, as we dig into your word, we know that's where the power is. We ask that you would help us to be eager to learn, eager to know you more, that we would have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts desiring to understand your ways and your truth this morning. Open up your word to us. Speak to us through it. You know where each one of us are, Lord. We ask that you would use your word in a mighty way in each of our lives. Transform us by it. Embolden us to go forth and live it out and proclaim it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Revelation chapter 11. And uh, we find ourselves in, it's been a few weeks, so I just want to recap a little bit sort of how we got here. The Apostle John, we've, we've gone through the six, the six seal judgments and then the six, uh, or sorry, the seven seal judgments, the seventh led into the trumpet judgments. And the six trumpet judgments took us through the end of chapter nine. And then there's the, these chapters 10 and 11 that kind of break from the trumpet judgments to give us this unfolding scene. The Apostle John is drawn away from standing on the sidelines and becomes a participant in this action. The Lord's revealing of what is to come and the things that are going to take place. So it's very dramatic, and we see in chapter 11 where we left off was that this dramatic scene continued after this uh, situation of John being instructed to eat this scroll and the effect that God's word has, the end of chapter 10 ends with verse 11, which says, And they said to me, You must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now this is, of course, in contrast to the, the previous times when we've been given this same picture of people coming from a mass multitude. In, uh, in, the pre in the preceding chapters, we saw that there's this mixed multitude 
of people of every t- tribe and tongue and nation and people in Revelation 5, 9 and 7, 9. But those were the redeemed. Those were the ones that God had saved and were his own. Now these are talking about his enemies. This is a different kind of multitude being spoken of here in chapter 11. So the Apostle John, we mentioned the last time, he's told to measure the temple in Jerusalem. And setting our bearings, this would be the temple that exists in Jerusalem at the midway point through the seven-year tribulation. This is still to come in the future. It hasn't even, construction hasn't even begun yet on this temple. But it will. And that we know that the sacrifices, the temple will be rebuilt, sacrifices will resume, and that's going to be the reality during this time, during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. Daniel 9.27 is where we primarily find this information. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, seven years, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So if it ends, it has to have already begun. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. This is one who um, sets up the image at this time in the temple, and he makes all things desolate. The, the great world leaders that come to power, making the grandest promises and getting the, the grand followings, are the ones that reap the most destruction. And so that's this man being talked about here, the abomination of desolation, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. That's not Daniel 9, 27. We also find it in Daniel 12, 11, And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So just a, a few days over three and a half years is that time frame. So this is the second half of the tribulation period. We'll talk a little bit more about this. So what we have here is um, kind of setting the stages, setting the stage for this temple being rebuilt. It's mentioned here in Revelation 11.1. 1. John's instructed to measure it, but only partially. He's instructed to measure the building portion itself, the holy place and the holy holies, holy of holies, but not the courtyard, um, the inner courtyard, but not the outer courtyard, which is used for um, animal sacrifices. Um, That takes place in the inner courtyard and the worshipers, but the outer courtyard is called the courtyard of the Gentiles. That's as far as they were allowed in the temple complex, and that's going to be the case again in the future. And we saw that last time, the reason John's instructed not to measure that outer court is that it was given to the Gentiles who are also about, it says in uh, Revelation 11, verse 2, about to tread underfoot the holy city, Jerusalem, for 42 months. Now, this is um, a question of, when we're talking about 42 months, what are we talking about here? Let's try and get our bearings. Here's our overview of, the, this is just kind of a thumbnail overview of the events of the biblical timeline from the time of the cross forward. Here we are in the church age. The next event, we believe, is the rapture. And this is the seven-year tribulation, the time also known as Jacob's trouble. And it's broken into three and a half years, three and a half and three and a half. Then we have the second coming of Christ, the thousand-year millennial reign, which then continues on into all eternity um, heavenly Jerusalem comes down to earth. We'll get into that in Revelation 20, 21, 22, and basically heaven and earth merge. And the perfect conditions under Christ's kingdom become even more perfect and extend for all eternity. So when we have a reference to this seven-year tribulation period, this is how you can think about this. If some of you think a little bit more visually, um, we have three and a half years We have the rapture, the appearance on the scene of the Antichrist. He comes to set up a a one-world government, and there's a one-world religion simultaneously. And uh, he comes promising prosperity and all kinds of wonderful things. uh, During the first three and a half years, the Jews, who are very devout, 
and who remain on the earth after the rapture because they were not saved, will once again be worshiping God in the temple in Jerusalem. They're going to be offering sacrifices, fulfilling, fulfilling those ceremonial requirements that we read about in the Torah that have been set aside since 70 AD, since the temple was destroyed. And they're going to resume. And the seven-year period before, behind me here begins with a covenant. Now, it's my thinking that this is probably going to take the shape of a worldwide peace treaty of some sort. It's going to establish for everyone on earth a certain basic level of freedoms and human rights, freedom to worship. Um, hostilities are going to be put on hold at least, so, so wars stop with this kind of pseudo-peace. All kinds of promises get made. Economic prosperity, there's going to be money for everyone. But it's all a swampy soup of lies and a house of cards that is not capable of sustaining itself. It just can't last. So therefore, when, these, when, when this begins, we have the um, worship taking place in Jerusalem among the Jewish people. But then halfway through, you see that middle line behind me, that's when the abomination of desolation is placed, some kind of idol, in the Holy of Holies, and the Antichrist, also known as the beast, demands that the world worship him. He's going to shift all the allegiance and all the worship that's taking place around the world, worship of God, worship of nature, worship of whatever, is going to be directed, he's hoping, to himself. That's going to be his, his goal. Israel will no longer be able to seek God by drawing near to him within the temple. That stops because there, it's... It's tarnished. It's, um, it's defiled. That's the right word. The temple gets defiled by the Antichrist. So they can't worship there anymore. So instead, God is going to reveal himself on the outside of the temple for these second three and a half years, literally in the streets of the holy city, the city that is being trampled by his enemies, these people who are basically God-rejecting Gentiles. Um, here's some references that you're going to see to this uh, period of three and a half years. It's called time, times, and, half, and a half time. It's called three and a half years. It's called 42 months, and it's called 1,260 days. Now, the very next verse we saw last time uses this number, verse, Revelation 11, verse 3, and I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So with both of these references, these 42 months and these 1,260 days, the difficult thing that, that Bible commentators debate is, are we talking here about the first three and a half years or the second three and a half years? And it's difficult to know. However, I think we do have some clues that point us to the fact that these are talking about the same time frame, the 42 months and the 1260 days in Revelation 2 and 11, 2 and 3. And the way that we can get there is by looking at the book of Luke. Luke 21, 24, And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into the nations. And Jerusalem, note this, will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Well, when is it that the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled? Well, it's at the end of this three and a half years. We can even back up. It's the end of the three and a half years with the second coming of Christ. That's when the time of the Gentiles are over, they're put to an end, and Christ defeats his enemies, the, the God-rejecting Gentiles. So that passage in Luke 21 helps us to correlate the trampling underfoot of Jerusalem by the nations, by the Gentiles, coming to an end 42 months would indicate the second half of the tribulation. Now, when we talked last time about these two witnesses, I'm going to put their picture up here. Here's these two witnesses. Now, they, they go and they are part of this great ministry that God establishes for 1,260 days. It is difficult to know, again, 
Are we talking about the first three and a half years or the second three and a half years? The, uh, the second three and a half years would make a lot of sense if it's the same as these 42 months of Gentiles trampling the holy city underfoot the, during the end of the time of the Gentiles. But then I guess you could ask the question, well, we, we know, skipping ahead a few verses, what happens. Their ministry is ended, they're killed, and then they are revived, and they're taken up to heaven. And we think, well, after 1260 days, wouldn't that be about the exact same time as our Lord Jesus is descending down to earth? And those would seem like maybe they are, you know, there's going to be a, a traffic collision or something like that. But um, the way that you would reconcile that is just that, you know, they don't happen at the exact same moment, that there, there's a, enough of a buffer there to where that's not an issue. If you say, well, I think this is the, the first three and a half years, then you have another problem, and that problem is that with all of these references, and this is where my study has taken me so far, I've got to study this further, but I believe that all of these numerical references are all pointing to the second three and a half years, and that none of them, as far as I can tell, point to the first three and a half years, whether you go to Matthew, whether you go to Luke, whether you go to Daniel, whether you go to Revelation, that all of them start with the midpoint of the tribulation, the establishment of the abomination of desolation in the temple, and then the numerical value speaks of that second three and a half years. So that's where I point, that, that's where I personally will place the witness of these um, two witnesses, the time, will place the ministry of these two witnesses is during the second three and a half years. I hope this is making sense. I know it's a lot to, to sort through. Um, the other issue, as we've seen, we've gone through six, we've gone through seven seal judgments and seven trumpet judgments. I'm sorry, six trumpet judgments at this point. Um, where do we place these? Do these occur during the, the first three and a half years or the second three and a half years? And I think that is a more difficult issue to pinpoint. Um, I'm inclined, based on the nature of the judgments, to put them in the second three and a half years, this time of judgment that God is pouring out on the earth. Although the flip side argument is if they're taking place in the first three and a half years, perhaps that is why the Antichrist can't maintain his control over the population of the earth because there's these judgments happening and he's shown to be ineffective. So it could, there's arguments to be made either way. I come down personally on the, the second three and a half years and see most of these judgments spoken of in the book of Revelation um, dealing with this, this second half. And I personally see the first three and a half years as basically a, a time of pseudo peace and prosperity, of freedom of worship and things going fairly well on the earth until the time of the abomination of desolation and then it just all completely falls apart. So um, that, that gives you sort of my take on Revelation, but you you may see it a little bit differently, and that's okay. All right, so let's keep moving here with these uh, these two witnesses that we we're just trying to recap this here. These two witnesses, um, forty-two months. These two witnesses came and they ministered on. They will minister on the earth. We're given the verses about the two olive trees, which is. Um, referring us back to information we got from Zechariah chapter 4, telling us that these two witnesses will be empowered continually by the Holy Spirit. This continual inpouring of olive oil, fuel, empowering them. They're given miraculous protection by God. We mentioned last time that they have this ability for fire to come forth from their mouths to de destroy their enemies. That's obviously supernatural. We mentioned some of the things last time um, that l draw our attention with these two witnesses to Moses and Elijah, things like uh, Malachi, um, the end of the, the book there, the end of the Old Testament really, leaves with a statement that Elijah must come first before um, the Lord's return. Moses and Elijah already appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. The two witnesses' miraculous powers are consistent with those given to Moses in Exodus and Elijah in 1 Kings. And finally, number four, the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, is a time when God is dealing specifically with his people, his own people, the Jewish nation. 
and they revere most Moses and Elijah above all others, and the gospel could be, would be, and seemingly will be well-received coming from them. Now, it's also, I should state, it's also equally possible that these are two new figures that haven't occurred yet in history, and we don't know who they are. Um, it's, you know, that there is an argument to be made from silence that if God wanted us to know their identities, he would have told us. So we don't want to be too dogmatic about that, but uh, we do note that there are some real similarities with other passages of Scripture. So if we're going to identify them, I would personally go with Moses and Elijah. We, uh, we saw last time this abyss, this abyss in chapter 11, verses 7 and 8. The, uh, the beast, we were told, comes up out of the abyss. The beast is a reference to the book of Daniel and the prophecy. Um, you know, you think of a wild animal. So here in Revelation, we're introduced to this beast for the first time. We're told that he comes up out of the abyss to attack the two witnesses. This is a reference to this person named the beast. It's a person. And if you go back to Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 and verse 11, we clearly have the angel of the abyss spoken of there as Satan. It's, it's easy to identify that person as Satan. So now this beast that comes out of the abyss has to be referring to his satanic empowerment of a human being. We also saw in chapter 9 that the abyss was the location from which demonic activity was, came up and was unleashed upon the earth. So this shows us his, this beast figure, his true violent nature, which will begin these final three and a half years of the tribulation, um, begins by, um, which includes murdering these two witnesses along the, the line. Satan is called the, the murderer, the one who loves death. Um, we also are told that the entire world will witness, once these two witnesses are killed, the whole world will witness... sexually perverse urban culture. Egypt in scripture is an identification of the land of very sophistication, high society, influential culture, but also a land of idolatry, of religious um, straying, a land of slavery and oppression, and uh, many other things. So this location is also identified as the location where the Lord was crucified, which has to be Jerusalem. Okay, so their bodies, once they are killed by the beast, are left to lie in the streets of Jerusalem. Then it says in verse 9, this is where we're going to pick up this morning, then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations, again, these are God's enemies, this large multitude, will see their dead bodies three and a half days will, and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. They don't allow them to have a proper... burial. Three and a half days, they are left there by the wayside. What do we make of this? Well, um, again, this is the same multitude spoken of in chapter 10, verse 11, the one that caused John this consternation, this heartburn within. And this is not just one nation spoken of, not just one people, but the whole world. This is a description of the entire world, especially the God-rejecting world. The whole world at this time will be in rebellion against God and 
have fallen under apostasy and, and, and be in control of the beast and his satanic system. And God's enemies, whether through TV or in person or some kind of media, some way, will look on their dead bodies lying in the street. These are God's prophets. These are faithful men, ones he has used mightily for three and a half years. And they are left there for their bodies to decay in the open, lying in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days. Now, over in the Middle East, for centuries, maybe millennia, the practice has been, because of the hot culture, that when someone dies, they try to bury them as fast as possible. They try to bury them the same day, either before sunset or, at worst case scenario, before sunset of the next day. Maybe they pass away during the night, and they just make sure to get them in the ground before the, the sun sets on the next day. It's hot. Um, the process of, of decay sets in very, very quickly. And so that's the typical procedure in the Middle East to this very day, whether you're talking about um, pretty much anywhere in the Middle East. That's, that's very well-established and very well-maintained. Even when, for instance, um, Arabic people of a Muslim background will move to the United States and live in a northern climate like ours, it's still important to them culturally to bury their loved ones on the same day because it's a long-standing traditional practice. It's, the, it's considered the decent and appropriate thing to do, not to mention the fact that it's the best way to protect public health at the same time. So to not do so would be the ultimate disgrace and insult, and it just speaks to the depths of their hatred of God. His enemy's hatred will be without limit. We're starting to see some of the the kernels of this in our own day, I believe, of just hatred without any checks, without any limits, no decency. We again have this um, phrase, those who dwell on the earth. Um, we've seen this before several times throughout the book of Revelation. Those who dwell on the earth. Um, that is the end of verse 10, those who dwell on the earth. Once again, um, that phrase is not just people like us who live on the earth, but it specifically is a derogatory term in the book of Revelation. It occurs again and again and again, and it means peop, a, a specific kind of people, those who live for the earth, who are only earthly minded, who are not spiritually minded, who are not eternally minded, who are not heavenly minded, who are not God minded, but who are minded of this life, of temporal things, not eternal things, and specifically for the earth itself, the type who are more than happy to worship the earth. So this is a, a negative statement, those who dwell on the earth. Moving into verse 11. Now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. So God performs a miracle. And they stood on their feet as they're resurrected. And naturally, what this causes for all those who are witnessing this, whether through media or maybe they're directly there in Jerusalem, whatever their case is, great fear fell on those who saw them. So their greatest triumph, the thing that they were so excited about, if we go back to verse 10, look at how excited they are. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. They, they were preaching the exact opposite of what they wanted to hear. They were prophesying. They were teaching. They were witnessing. They were witnessing of God. People who want nothing to do with God, who don't want to hear about him, who don't want to think about him. These two witnesses were just the ones who got under their skin and they hated like nothing else. So when they kill them, they rejoice. To such a degree, they're so excited at their deaths that they're even sending gifts to one another. Um, one of the uh, commentaries I read by Warren Wearsby, he refers to this as the, the satanic Christmas. That's a, an appropriate way of describing 
this, and it resonates at this time of year when we're in the midst of the Christmas season. People love to give each other gifts. And they were giving each other gifts, we'll see, because of the death of these two witnesses. Now, what they're forced to watch is God performing a miracle in verse 11. So they think that they've killed these two witnesses. But their greatest joy and victory and triumph and celebration and satanic Christmas gets cut short after three and a half days. It is a very short-lived celebration. What we see about these two witnesses is they get to share in a unique way in our Lord Jesus' resurrection. The enemies are forced to watch it unfold before their eyes, and they're going to be horrified, and they're going to be filled with tremendous fear when they see this happen. Oh, no. You, just, you, can, you can sense the dread that comes over them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. What would that sound like? A loud voice out of heaven saying, Come on up here. The two witnesses are addressed by this audible voice from heaven, summoning and welcoming them. And just like our Lord Jesus, after his resurrection, ascended up into the clouds, so these witnesses also will ascend into the clouds to be received into heaven. I have no doubt that these two witnesses will be received into heaven with great fanfare, with great celebration for their faithfulness. Moving into uh, verse 13, in the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. So Jerusalem gets hit by this massive earthquake. It destroys a tenth of the city and um, the destruction leads to the death of 7,000 people. It says the rest were afraid and gave glory to God in heaven. So this is in direct contrast to the earthquake we've already seen in the sixth seal judgment of Revelation 6 verse 12. When that earthquake happened, as well, as well as many other natural disasters around the same time, it caused God's enemies to not repent, but to hide from him, to hide in caves, to try and hide themselves in the cleft of rocks and crags. But this earthquake causes the people who are witnessing this to acknowledge and give glory to God. Now, just because they recognize the source of the natural disaster and recognize God's power doesn't mean that they come to faith in Christ. It would be wonderful if it had that effect. But at least it causes them to give him glory. Now, what effect is this going to have on the beast, the Antichrist? Well, it's going to be very displeasing to him to have his loyal subjects giving credit and glory to God and I believe that this will only make him double down on his efforts to receive their worship for himself. Now I want to pause here for a second to note the fact that through all things, even a natural disaster, even God's judgment, God will be glorified somehow, some way in the midst of his judgment. And because of his judgment. And through his judgment. I think sometimes we think of judgment as, um, you know, just this really negative concept that, uh, you know, God has kind of maybe somehow lost control and this is his last resort to try and regain control because he's out of options. Not the case. We doubt that God could possibly be glorified through judgment. I mean, that's when punishment is doled out, right? But the thing about judgment is that it convicts the world. It convicts the world of their sin and their unrighteousness and their wickedness and it reminds everyone, believer and unbeliever alike, who's the boss, who is the ultimate, who is the one who has all the power, who is the one in control of history, who's the, the sovereign, and who is in total control. And so God often will use judgment to accomplish his purpose, it might be to cause people to even temporarily have to glorify him. But there's another way that God will sometimes use his judgment. And we've seen this often through biblical history and in the course of world history, where God uses judgment also as a catalyst for change. The things have been progressing on sort of this downhill slide. And it seems like things are just getting worse 
and worse and evil is just continuing and continuing on this downhill trajectory and it seems as if evil is going to win. But right then, God will often intervene with his judgment and many times it will involve suffering and death. It, that tends to be the case. But God will use it to turn the tables and churn history and change the trajectory. It is absolutely within his power and many times his will to do so, and he will use judgment to do it. In the book of Revelation, there's a word. It's the word great. And sometimes it doesn't quite make it into our English translations. It's um, megale in Greek. But it occurs eight times, and it's very notable to look at how this word is used. First occurrence is in verse 8, the great city, description of Jerusalem. And the last is in verse 19, talking about a great hailstorm. But what's interesting is to see how this word progresses throughout the book of Revelation. It begins with describing a great city, this great city, Sodom and Egypt, this pagan worldly city full of culture and vitality, but also full of wickedness and religious idolatry. And then it goes on to describe in verse 11, when they see these two witnesses resurrected, it causes great fear to fall upon God's enemies. And then they heard a great voice saying, come up here. The great voice is God's voice. And then there was a great earthquake when God doles out his great judgment. And then in 15, there is a great voice, a multitude of great voices, a heavenly choir of great voices that are going to make a great declaration that we're about to see. And then in verses 17 through 19, there's a, it talks about God's great power. And then it talks about people from people who were um, small and great, people who run the gamut. And then it talks about a great hailstorm, again, God's judgment. So we see this, this greatness in terms of the city of Jerusalem, supposed greatness, and we see it turned into great fear, and then we see it talk about the great works of God. And so, just in terms of this one word, even, and its usage by the Apostle John in Revelation, the entire book and the entire direction, the entire story just gets turned on its head. So, these events of Revelation 11, verses 13 and 14, this earthquake... Wraps up in verse 14, the, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming. So we're still under the sixth trumpet judgment at this point. And it's not till verse 15 that the seventh trumpet judgment sounds. So this information in chapters 11 and 10 and 11 is this parenthetical information that often occurs in the book of Revelation where we're going along, you know, seal judgments, we're going along trumpet judgments, and then it breaks. And it stops and it gives us this parenthetical information. And here it has just focused us in on these two witnesses. But now it's about to pick up with the process of these seven trumpets, with the seventh trumpet sounding. It says in verse 15, the, uh, the seventh trumpet, then the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. What is this a description of? Well, what it is, is not the actual event. This is a declaration. This is a heavenly declaration of future victory. And people sometimes get confused about this. It, it gets their chronology of the book of Revelation all turned around. They, they, they hear a statement like this, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever. And they think, oh, uh, is, is God setting up his kingdom here in Revelation chapter 11? And the answer is no. This is not the action taking place. This is a heavenly declaration, a preview of coming attractions, this statement of what is to come. So this is not the victory itself. That takes place in Revelation chapter 21 at the end of the book. But here, this proclaims and it predicts what is to come. So where does the earth stand right now at this point in Revelation chapter 11 as well as in our day. What do you think? Well, the earth is currently the dominion of Satan. But it belongs to Jesus Christ. So there's a dichotomy, right? 
the dominion of Satan. It's, it's under his dominion, but it belongs to Jesus Christ. How do we reconcile these two? Well, this statement tells us, it, give, it gives us the end of the story. It gives us the sneak, the sneak preview that the world belongs to Jesus Christ. He is the conqueror who has already defeated Satan. He's a defeated foe. He's defeated sin and death. However, what's not yet been resolved is that Satan's ability to control this earth, to control the kings, to control the kingdoms. God is in ultimate control, but he is allowed free reign to work his wickedness. And his ability to do that in our time, as well as here in Revelation, has not yet been revoked. When God revokes it, it stops immediately. Satan is the usurper. He's the counterfeit. And he's the, he's the counterfeit Christ, the Antichrist. He's the prince of the power of the air, which I think takes on so much significance during COVID. What are people most afraid of more than anything else in all of life? The air. Satan has said, be afraid of the air. The one who temporarily dominates the kingdoms of this earth will see his kingdoms and his counterfeit Antichrist defeated. That is to come in Revelation 19 and following. At that time, Satan will be imprisoned for a thousand years. He's not able to work his wonders. Wonders, that's, I'm using that sarcastically. Um, he's, going to be, he's going to permanently use, permanently lose, I should say, his temporary kingdoms when they are permanently replaced by God's kingdom, which is eternal. Where, how does that leave you feeling? It leaves me feeling very hopeful, very optimistic. So I want to encourage us with this this morning. Don't ever get discouraged or depressed by living in this broken world, filled with evil, filled with sin, filled with wickedness, filled with lies. The methods of Satan get very frustrating to us. We must remember that Jesus Christ is always, has been, always, will be, always King of kings and Lord of lords. His kingdom of righteousness is coming. That's an awesome thing to look forward to. So we have so much hope. Let's take a look at verses 16 and following. And the 24 elders in heaven who sat before God on their thrones, get off their thrones, fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken the great power, your great power, and reigned. The nations were angry, like Psalm 2, our scripture reading this morning. And this is the same word, um, wrath, uh, in, in verse 18. The nations were full of wrath, but your wrath has come. So whose wrath is bigger? God's. And the time of the dead, that they should be judged, that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Okay, so what we see here is these 24 elders worship God. In light of this great heavenly declaration, it causes them to worship. And when we worship, what we want to do, what we strive to do in worship, whether it's through giving or prayer or studying God's word or worship in song is to declare God's worth and greatness in whatever the, the means of worship that that takes place in. That's what we want to be about as individuals and what we want to be about as a church. And these 24 elders here model it for us with seven specific qualities. Here are seven things that they worship God for in verse 18. He is all-powerful. These, all, uh, these come from 17 and 18, I'm sorry. He's all-powerful. He's eternal. He reigns. He vindicates. He judges righteously. He rewards graciously. And he punishes justly. So in verse 18, why are these nations so angry at God? You ever wonder that? Why are they so mad at God? What did... What did God do, or what do they think God did, or why, why are they so upset at God? Why do they have this anger? Why do they have this wrath? The answer is because they want their own way. 
They want to be in charge and not God. And there's so much of human nature wrapped up in that. The reason people reject God is because they are striving to exalt themselves. Now, this is something that doesn't just affect the unbelieving world. It creeps into our lives as believers as well, in that all of us, just as human beings, are naturally selfish and self-interested and self-promoting and want to exalt ourselves. So this passage puts that in check for us, at least I hope it will. It provides a critical reminder that we all need, that sinful desires, where those sinful desires come from, and that if unchecked, it's going to lead to our own destruction. Just as God's enemies eventually had to deal with his wrath, that what, is our self, what does our destruction look like if these things run unchecked in our lives? Well, it could be self-destruction. Just the, the way we go about our lives, the, the decisions we make, could just cause us to self-destruct. It just, there's consequences built in, and our lives just destroy themselves. That's one possibility. It could be massive humiliation that the more we exalt ourselves, the more God makes sure to have to put us down in our place, and that can be embarrassing and humiliating. There's also the fact that God may directly intervene with his divine judgment, and that can cause our destruction as well. And, and if it causes, uh, if we find ourselves in that spot where we've exalted ourselves, and God has to intervene with his own judgment to to bring about the destruction of what we've built, it's not going to be a pretty picture. None of these offer a pleasant outcome. But the flip side of that is that rather, God's will and his design is that we do just the opposite, and that we acknowledge him, we worship him, and we serve him first, and that we be second, and that we be others focused. This is the first and second greatest commandments. And that we look at how he would have us to serve others rather than ourselves and our own selfish desires. There is so much we need to know packed into these two verses of these 24 elders and how they worship God and what they're identifying in these seven characteristics. Finally, let's look at verse 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven. So this isn't the earthly, um, what do you call it, uh, the earthly copy. This is the real deal. This is the temple that exists in heaven for all time to this day where God is. And we see that temple, the, the building portion of the temple, inside the outer courtyard, the inner courtyard is this temple building. It begins with the holy place, has three pieces of furniture inside, then there's a veil, and then there is the holy of holies, behind which there is only one piece of furniture, and that is the Ark of the Covenant. And there it is, displayed for us for the first time, this magnificent scene. And the Ark of the Covenant was seen in his temple, and as you would expect, it's like the Rainforest Cafe on steroids. There's lightnings and thunderings and noises and earthquakes and great hail you can you can sense the power the shaking the um just the the sheer volume of it everything that happens just because it's opened for us to glimpse into what does that tell us well this chapter begins with the reconstructed temple in jerusalem at the beginning of chapter 11 it's um a temple that um, there, there's already talk about how they're going to build it today quickly. They, they want to do it quickly. They're talking about using, using new building materials like concrete blocks and different new materials. It's going to be grand, but it is also going to be earthly. Chapter 11 begins with this earthly temple, this tribulation temple. But it ends with God's heavenly temple, which we're allowed to peek inside. The chapter begins with the Gentiles trampling the holy city of Jerusalem for 42 months. But it ends with the declaration that the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ is coming and he will reign forever and ever. So earthly Jerusalem is going to give way to heavenly Jerusalem. And Satan's temporary kingdoms are going to give way to God's eternal kingdoms when he is 
eternal kingdom, singular, when, he is, when Satan is defeated. When the conditions around us, this is where it applies to us, are depressing and evil seems to be winning, this chapter is for us. It draws our attention to the fact that the evil one and the evil of this world are no match for what's coming. They're no match for God Almighty. So our job is to walk, is to live in such a way that we're able to navigate this life and this crazy world walking by faith and not by sight. Remembering that with God, all things are possible. We don't ever want to say that's impossible. We don't ever want to say, ah, oh, well, you know, if, on, if only. I, well, you know, just seems like that's not going to happen. With God, all things are possible. Note that word all. That comes from the book of Matthew. All. All things are possible. All things are possible. We live each day to praise God who is all-powerful, eternal, these seven attributes, who reigns, who vindicates, who judges righteously, who rewards graciously, and who punishes justly. This chapter tells us about our God. It tells us about his judgment. It tells us about human nature. And it tells us about his plan for the future. Great chapter, chapter 11. We, I know we hit it fast, and there's a lot to digest. It's, you know, a lot to process through. But I believe that it is timely for where we stand this sixth day of December in this crazy year 2020. This is the passage we need. So reflect on that this week. And look at the implications for your own life. What does God want to refine in me? What's the perspective he wants me to maintain? How does that affect how I go about my life living by faith and not by sight? If you're here this morning and you don't know the Savior, Jesus Christ, again, we've mentioned it earlier this morning, so critical and so vital. If you want to know the all-powerful one, you want to have a relationship with the Holy One, the God of the universe, there's only one way, and that one way is Jesus Christ, His Son, the one who is fully God and fully man at the same time sent to earth for a unique mission, the only one capable of carrying out that mission, of taking care of, wiping out that penalty that you deserve for your sin. He washed that penalty away. He died on the cross so that you can live, so that you can have resurrection life, just like we talked about these two witnesses. Jesus Christ is the first one to have that experience of resurrection. He's the first fruits of all those who would come after him by faith. That we believe, you know, I had a conversation about this with somebody recently about if you're going to hang your hat on one thing for your eternal destiny, I would strongly suggest hanging all of, all, putting all your cards, hanging your hat on the only one who has done it first, Jesus Christ. Right? Nobody can prove that he didn't. There's never been a body found. In fact, all of ch history completely changed at a year, like basically the year zero. Everything was B.C. or, or B.C.E. before the cross. Everything is A.D. Or, or C.E. afterwards. I mean, history completely changed on the death and resurrection of this one man. Nothing has ever been the same since. So investigations lead consistently to the fact that it is true, that he said he was going to raise again from the dead. He did it. And millions of people around the world believe it and have received it. His sacrifice on the cross is a personal one for you. And you can have that same confidence of eternal life. Basically, if I died tomorrow, where would I go? Well, I've received Jesus Christ, the, the resurrected one, the one who is the resurrection and the life, who conquered sin and death on the cross. I received him as mine. What he has, I have. I have eternal life, not because of anything I did, but because of everything that Jesus did for me. So if you've never done that, I pray that you'll do that this morning, wherever you are, many watching online, I pray that you will make that decision to trust in Jesus Christ for salvation if you've never done so before. Let's close in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for who you are and how you work and that you reveal yourself to us in your word. We pray that we would find our grounding, our marching orders, your will, your design, your desire, all of it in your word. And that we would take it 
and that we would go forth with great confidence that we can only have in you because of your word and because of its truthfulness and because of its power and your power. Empower us to live in this broken and fallen world filled with evil. May we be lights for you. May we live by faith, walk by faith, not by sight, living in a way that is different and in a way that is a testimony. Lord, help us to um, go forth in a way that honors you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for this Christmas season. We pray that you would um, bless this time of reflection as we look forward to the celebration of the birth of your son who came to earth 2,000 years ago. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you guys please stand for this last song? Greg told me his communion Sunday I was trying to think of a song that would be fitting and this one this one came to me and just uh, the importance of the blood of Jesus and what it does for us and uh, John Baptist said behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and uh, he did that by shedding his blood for us
thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for your blood, Lord Jesus. What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood. Revelation chapter 11, but if you want to see the whole panorama of the book of Revelation, just head over here. Becky has done a great job of making this giant timeline of the book over in the education wing, um, so I'd encourage you to stop by there and, and check that out, and you know, many of you are um, you know, visual learners, and you like to get your bearings on the book, so that's a great opportunity to do that as you're heading out that way this morning. We'll close from the book of Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen.